Welcome to my deep dive learning path where I show you everything about AWS Lambda extensions to more easily integrate Lambda with your favorite tools. I'm Julian Wood, a senior developer advocate for serverless at AWS. This video is part of a whole series. If you're wanting a good understanding or grounding on what Lambda extensions are, start at the first video to get up to speed. In this last video, I'm going to be looking at how extensions can send logs to custom destinations and then wrap up the series. Lambda automatically captures runtime logs and streams them to Amazon CloudWatch. This log stream contains the logs that your function code and extensions generate, and also the platform logs that Lambda generates as part of the function invocation. Lambda extensions can use the Lambda Runtime Logs API to subscribe to log streams directly from within the Lambda execution environment. Lambda streams the logs to the extension, and the extension can then process, filter, and send the logs to any preferred destination. First, the extension needs to register with the extension's API in the normal way to receive the extension identifier. The extension can then subscribe to receive logs by sending a request to the Logs API. The Logs API allows extensions to subscribe to three different log streams. Function logs that the Lambda function generates and writes to standard out or standard error. Lambda platform logs, such as the start, end, and report lines. And extension logs that extension code generates. The logging extension needs to run a local endpoint to receive the logs from Lambda. Lambda does send all logs to CloudWatch even when an extension subscribes to one or more of the log streams. You can disable writing to CloudWatch logs by disabling access via an I am deny policy. You can choose one of the following protocols to receive the logs. HTTP, which is recommended, Logs are delivered to a local HTTP endpoint the extension sets up as an array of records in JSON format. Only HTTP is supported, not HTTPS, and you can choose to receive logs through put or post. You can also use TCP, and then logs are delivered to a TCP port in ndjson format. Just to explain why HTTP is preferred to TCP. With TCP, Lambda can't acknowledge that logs are delivered to the application layer so you may lose logs if your extension crashes, and there's also a chance logs can get corrupted. Lambda can only send logs to destinations that are inside the execution environment and reserves port 9001. So don't pick that, but there are no other port number restrictions. Lambda can buffer logs and deliver them to the subscriber. You can optionally configure that as part of the subscription request, which I'll show shortly. Log subscriptions do consume memory resources because each subscription opens a new memory buffer to store the logs. This memory buffer counts towards overall function memory consumption. You can se select the maximum time to buffer a batch, the maximum size of the logs to buffer, and the number of events to buffer in memory. Something worth bearing in mind is, if the logs extension cannot process incoming logs quickly enough, Lambda might have to drop logs to keep within the memory allocation. Lambda does add a platform.logs drop, logs dropped record with the number of dropped records. Looking at the Lambda lifecycle, which I covered in detail in the videos on building Lambda extensions, let's look at logs and how that field fits into the lifecycle. When the extension initializes it, is, it initializes, it registers with the extension's API. The extension should start then the logs receiver. This is the local HTTP or TCP endpoint that's going to receive the logs from Lambda. When the extension is ready to receive logs, it registers with a logs API with a put API call using that AWS Lambda runtime API environment variable and the version prefix 2020.08.15 and then slash logs. In the request, it needs to send the extension identifier in the header and in the body includes which log streams to subscribe to, platform, function, and extension. In this example, the extension is subscribing to platform and function only. You also add the optional buffering configuration and then the destination protocol and address where the logs need to be sent. Sandbox resolves locally to the execution environment. The logs extension is now subscribed and Lambda starts to send any logs to the local endpoint, which can then process and filter them or do anything else, send them to a preferred destination. Here are some example platform start, end, and report logs. You can see that this is the same information that you get in CloudWatch logs, showing the duration and memory metrics. The platform log also captures runtime or execution environment errors. 
Here's an example of two function log messages. Again, the same messages your function usually sends to CloudWatch logs. When the extension has finished processing logs, it uses the extension API to request the next event. And as normal, if there are no pending invocations, Lambda freezes the execution environment until it needs it again. So always nice to see this actually in action. I have a demo of a logs extension packaged in a function packaged as a container image. The extension runs a local HTTP endpoint to receive logs directly from Lambda. This subscribes to receive platform and function logs, but not to receive extension logs. The extension could be extended to filter, transform, or, proce or process the logs in some way. In this more simple demo, the logs are copied to S3. The logs can be stored long-term in S3 for archiving or sent onto another system for analysis or troubleshooting. Again, you can try yourself from GitHub. There are two versions. I'm going to show the container image deployment demo, and you can link to the repo via the QR code. I have a log extension which runs a local HTTP server, and I have the files locally for this extension, which are stored, and I'm going to add it to the container image. The Python extension is going to write the logs to S3 using the put object API call. I use a Docker file to build the image for the extension, and I'm going to use the multi-stage build with a minimum Python image to copy the files from my local machine into the container image and install the Bota3 dependency using standard pip install. I then start a new base image and copy the files and dependencies to the final extension image, which again gets pushed up to ECR. I then have a simple Lambda function, which returns a response to the client, and ultimately these function logs are going to be sent to S3. Looking at the Docker file to build my function, I add the previously created extension image and add the files from the image into the function container image. And further down in the Docker file, I set the Lambda handler. A function is then deployed using SAM with a package type of image and a con configured with an IAM role, allowing access to an S3 bucket created as part of the deployment. And there's also metadata here to say where the Docker file and function code is located. And again, I've deployed this in advance to save some time, but it really doesn't take very long if you do it yourself. So into the AWS Management Console and heading to the Elastic Container Repository, I can see that there is an image uploaded for the extension and another image uploaded for the function, which includes the files from the image. Looking uh, now at the Lambda function, when I head into it, I can see for the Lambda function configuration that there are actually not going to be any layers added as you can't with container images. And the function has been built using the Docker file from the function container image I previously uploaded. Here's the S3 bucket name configured as an environment variable, which the logs extension uses to know where to send the logs. So I have configured a test event and I'm going to invoke the function a few times. And you can see on this first invocation, I'm going to get a successful response. And why, just for fun, why don't I go and deploy or go and invoke that function just a few more times to generate some more logs. If I then head over to the S3 console, I can see the log files have arrived in S3 from the extension. The extension works seamlessly behind the scenes. The function doesn't even know logs are heading to S3. I can then go ahead and I can open the files from S3 and I can see when they open that they, uh, I've got, I expect to see the platform and the function logs. Let's just zoom in and word wrap so I can see that. And, but I don't actually have the logs from the actual extension as I choose not to subscribe to these. So Lambda has sent the logs directly to the extension without going to CloudWatch, and the extension has sent the, the logs directly onto S3. And you can use this to send logs to any custom destination. Lastly, some tips for managing logging extensions. Think about the subscription buffering settings to manage memory and the number of logs you can process. Separate the receiving and then sending out of logs to be more efficient. And you can think about using an in-memory queue for this. And as I said, rather use HTTP over TCP for your log receiver, as you're less likely to lose or corrupt any logs. <clears throat> In this video, I've been through the Logs API and how you can subscribe to receive logs directly from Lambda. I explain the destination protocols and buffering settings, and then walk through the Lambda lifecycle again, highlighting logs and showed what it looks like. I showed a demo of sending logs directly to S3 using an extension in a function packaged as a container image. And lastly, some tips for optimizing your logging extensions. 
There's a lot more demo code on GitHub, which you can explore to learn more about extensions. Look at the app config code to see how you can use an extension. The custom runtime shows how to build an extension with loads of logging to help you understand the full Lambda lifecycle. And then there are two versions of the logs extensions, one for zip archive functions and one for container image functions. And plenty more in other languages, including example extension wrapper scripts. And please feel free to contribute and add your own interesting examples. So that's the end of the video series. I've covered a lot. Hopefully it's all helped to get a good understanding of Lambda extensions. I went through how extensions are a new way to integrate Lambda with a whole set of tools. You can add them to your functions to augment the capabilities of your functions for a whole number of use cases. I explained the difference between internal and external uh, extensions in details and how to use them with some demos you can try yourself. I spent a lot of time going through the updates to the Lambda lifecycle and how you can influence how Lambda works, and then even deeper to help you build your own extensions using the Extensions API. I covered how you can receive logs directly from Lambda using the Logs API and how you can still use extensions in functions packaged as container images without using, Lambda's layer, without using Lambda layers, and with some helpful tips and tricks throughout. Again, for the last time, plenty more information on all things serverless. Head over to serverlessland.com with lots of resources, blogs, videos, workshops, and learning paths, everything about serverless on AWS. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate you spending the time to learn about AWS Lambda extensions, and hopefully you can put what you've seen into action. My name is Julian Wood, and you can find me on Twitter at Julian underscore Wood.